Let me pray with us as we get underway. Dear Heavenly Father, your mercy um, is more over against your holiness and your purity. Lord, as we've been learning over the time in the book of James that you're good, you're always good. As John would say, there's, there's no darkness in you at all. There's nothing in you that's attracted to evil. There's nothing in you that would move anyone toward evil. And Lord, you're the God that without holiness, we could not uh, have fellowship with you. For Lord, you have made possible through Jesus to take into him what we couldn't bear and what we deserved so that he could bear the curse that we had brought upon ourselves that he could take the penalty into himself so that we could be free to have fellowship with you. And you united us with him and gave us his standing so that we could come with welcome and confidence before, the, before you. Lord, that's why, uh, Lord, you've rescued us not only today, but for every day and for eternity. That's why we can sing in the face of the darkest moments that, Lord, your goodness has followed us all the days of our lives. Lord, you, the promises you have given us are to those who love you by your grace. And today, Lord, for those that are in the hard places, for those that have known hardness and are walking hard paths, Lord, your mercy is more. Lord, you've given them riches beyond our wildest imagination. Lord, help us to hold on to that truth, to trust you today, to walk uh, forward uh, in delight and expectation because, Lord, you're running after us today with your mercy and your loving kindness. Lord, thank you for everyone who's here today. Lord, you have something for all of us. You want to speak to us through your word. Lord, give us hearts to hear. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, somebody has taken my tissue box from up here. So, and I need one, so... Does anyone, Rhonda, you have one by any chance? Oh, she doesn't. So I just put my wife on the spot right there. I'm Greg Kowser, by the way. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And, oh, thank you. Thank you, honey. Okay, thank you. So, well, this is Paul. Paul helped me out. So I want to give credit where credit's due. <clears throat> Paul's just saying, do something for that poor man up there. <laughs> All right. Um, we are coming to the end of our study in the book of James. And I want you to turn to James chapter 5, if you would, with me. And we're going to go right to the end. Uh, if you're here for the first time today, which I know some of you are because I met you out in the uh, lobby, out on the outside, I'm just sad for you because you missed all the riches on the way here. The good thing is uh, God has written it down so you can go back and pick it up uh, in terms of that. Uh, but we've been talking about uh, this series all the way through. We've subtitled it, Hold Fast. Hold Fast is a kind of a nautical, uh, kind of uh, drawn from the nautical world that has to do with uh, sailors and seamen uh, in the storm when something uh, is threatening uh, to take the ship down. Oh, thank you. I'm getting lots of help now, so I should be good. Um, when you're getting uh, a storm or something that's life-threatening, uh, the command that often comes from the captain is to hold fast find something that won't go overboard so that you don't go overboard with it. So it'd be something that would be central to the ship, that would be, a st it'd be the mast or something that was immovable that you could hold on to. And so we've talked about the book of James as he's writing to a group of people uh, who need to be told to hold fast because their lives truly are in a deep, deep, dark storm. And we've talked about this from the beginning uh, we often, uh, as people in the West, the, you know, the first world problems, as they say, we go to read the book of James and we think of difficult things like our iPhone screen cracking uh, or, or things getting too slow in the technical world or, um, as what's happening now, our grocery prices rising by 20%. I was going to say, I thought about the, the uh, Kroger thing. Now that our groceries are going up, if you go buy at Kroger's, we'll get a bigger percentage. So I just encourage you with that. Uh, but uh, all the things that are happening, we get concerned about those kinds of things. And here he's really talking to refugees. 
He's talking to people who have lost their homes. They've lost their families. And, and in some of the most egregious ways, not just that, that they've gotten split up, if you will, as they've run for their lives. And you can look at the backdrop in Acts chapter 8, uh, kind of uh, the Paul before he, the Saul before he becomes the Christian Paul uh, is busy persecuting Christians. And very likely the book of James is set in that moment. And so they're running for their lives, but it's not only that they're running for their lives, they lost their homes, they lost their social fabric simply because they're spread into the areas of Jerusalem and Judea and the areas around, but many of the people who are hunting them down are their family and friends. Right? As we look back at the early church, the very first Christians to die were Jews, and they died at the hands of their fellow Jews who rejected Jesus, our first a martyr outside of the Lord Jesus Christ is Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So we're writing to a group of people that are in a really, really dark moment. And James writes to this scattered group of people and tells them to hold fast. And the real question is, well, what does it mean to hold fast, James? And what do I hold fast to? All right. So we're going to come up to the end of the book of James here. Uh, and one of the things I want to encourage you, one of the things we've been trying to do as a church over time, we did it in Ephesians just recently, and, and of course in, in the book of James, is we're encouraging you to study along with us. And we have a, a, a goal, not only to get the content of the book of James, but to encourage good Bible study on your own, uh, to have some good habits where you're reading, thinking, pondering as you're working your way through. Well, one of the things we learned about good Bible study is that you, as you approach the book, it's always good to read the whole book as you begin. Don't just jump in the middle of some book, but read the whole book so you get kind of the lay of the land. So you just read it over and read it over, get the big idea. Then you start to break it down in its individual sections, and that's kind of what we've done as we've preached through it. Break it down in, in, a, in a letter, like the book of James. It's usually a paragraph or a little subsection, and then you just study it one at a time. And one of the things we want to do is we study it. We want to come to understand what it actually says. So we look at it carefully until we can actually explain it in a way that's faithful. But then it's not done because Bible study is always about transformation, not about information. Right? There, as we've said here often, uh, many of the people who followed Christ over the years, even as Ryan talked about in his testimony, we know a lot of stuff. We know a lot more stuff than we live. And when we don't live what we know, it really means, biblically speaking, we truly don't know it. We don't know it. Because to encounter the truth as through the help of the Holy Spirit is to be a person who comes to inhabit it, to live it, to embrace it. It becomes something that controls the way you think about God. It controls the way you think about yourself. It controls the way you think about your neighbor. It controls your sexual appetites. It controls the way you think about money. It controls how you look at your job. It controls how you view your role as a parent and as a husband or as a wife. It affects everything. So the issue here that James is moving them into a truth that he, he wants them to inhabit. He wants them to get inside of it. And he wants to say that the only way you're going to hold fast to life genuine real life is if you hold fast to me God is what he's going to say and so all the way through he points out many ways where they've not held fast to him they've went and grabbed something that's going to fail them in the midst of the storm a false savior so they went and grabbed something that's not secure and they've tried to survive and so they've adopted the ways of the world to deal with their stress and they're, they're going to go overboard and their lives are going to fail and that's what he's he's concerned about them so as we get to the end of the book of James, though, one of the things when you're reading well, as you work your way through the book, when you, as you keep moving on, you want to make sure you drag the whole book with you, okay? So you don't want to say, okay, now I'm in chapter 2, let me forget about chapter 1, and now I'm in a new section. No, everything you learned in chapter 1 needs to be carried forward into chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5. So before we read our passage, I want to carry forward some things. Here, oops, I always, it's always nice when I turn it on. Uh, I want to carry forward some truths that are many of the truths, some of the truths, but some really, really important truths that need to be brought into this passage before we get here. This is one of those passages, is if you haven't read the whole book of James, you may, be ten you may have a tendency to misapply it or misunderstand what it's offering. So I want to talk about that a little bit, right? So we started off, and we're going to come back to that passage. The key passage is the end of chapter 1, verses 12, down through about verse 18. The fundamental truth that he wants them to hold on to, 
which it seems counterintuitive given what's going on in their lives, is that God is always good. Always good. Invariably good. That he doesn't have one bad day. He doesn't have one off day. He doesn't lose it one day and look at Josh and say, Josh, you're just driving me crazy, bam, and gets him. God doesn't do that. God doesn't fall asleep one day and the world just runs on and God wakes up a day later and goes, oh no, my goodness, it's run out of control. That doesn't happen. That happens to us. Right, but it doesn't happen to him, right? And so to say that God is always good is to say that the things that are happening in our lives are not because God is evil or God is trying to make us do evil things. So James wants to make clear that evil comes from below. It comes from the darkness in our own hearts. Right? So we live in a world that's cursed because of human sin, and we live as human beings who are broken and bent away from God, and we're rebels, and so the evil that we experience comes from below in terms of that, and he wants to make it very clear. This is one of the crucial things because one of the things that we're going to find is that the evil one, the, the, the antagonist, the one who's over against God and his purposes, is going to try to get a hold of those dark desires in your own heart and encourage you that God isn't there and he doesn't care about you, especially when you're in the dark and things are going difficult. The second thing that James talks about is there's two paths, and when James talks about this, he's drawing on a, a vein of biblical wisdom that goes from the very beginning. There's two ways to go. There's the, life of, there's the path of life, and there's the path of death, and he talks about it all the way through. He wants them to choose life, which is an old phrase from, from Deuteronomy. He wants them to choose life, choose the path of life. You can choose the path of death if you want to, but you want to choose the path of life, and there are only two paths. There's not, there's not a, a path of life and then there's another path of life that I can make for myself and another path of life that somebody else can make. No, there's only one path of life. We're going to talk about that. Every other path leads to the same direction, and that's death. And James means that in a twofold sense. It not only uh, impoverishes your present life, but it will leave you ultimately separated from God eternally. Life, on the other hand, will add a deeper dimension to this life and then hold eternal dividends. Two things. Then third thing, to choose life is to humble yourself before God once as a rebel and then moment by moment as his child. So James is going to say the answer for facing difficulties is not to be henny penny and run around and scream, right? Not to be the freak out person and lose it. It's to steady your hearts. He says this in chapter four, steady your hearts and then lean and humble yourself under God. And so you recognize your dependency, you recognize your utter inability to get through it, and you call out to God and say, God, do for me, help me, help me to steady my heart, my mind, help me to think correctly. When my marriage is in trouble, Lord, I want to freak out, and I want to bail, or I want to give in, and I don't want to stand in there for your cause, so Lord, help me, steady my heart. When my child is walking away from Jesus, God, I want to freak out, steady my heart. When my husband has turned his back on Christ, God, I need help to hold on to you. All these kind of things as James is talking about here in terms of the, the issue here is that once, once life begins, and this is crucial for James, life begins by putting down your resistance to God, bowing the knee to him, and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver you from your sin. So it happens initially there. But it happens day after day after day, and every time you pray, every time you open your scriptures, every time you look to a, a fellow believer for advice, every day, moment by moment, you need help from him. So you don't do it once, and then, okay, God, we're good, I've got fire insurance, I'm looking forward to the future, and I'm going to kind of, I, I got it from here. Any moment that you think you have it, you're arrogant. Any moment you think you can make it on your own, that's your arrogance that's there. You have been created for dependence. You have been created for resources outside of yourself to navigate this life. You cannot make it on your own. So I don't care what uh, conference you go to, I don't mean how TED Talks you read or listen to, how many books you read, there's nobody that has the resources to change you into the kind of person who wants to love and knows how to love your spouse. There's no one else who can make you the kind of parent who can lean in and hold on to and keep loving your children toward Jesus through those difficult moments. The person who's going to make you want to do that and enable you to do that is Jesus. 
So we need that. So moment by moment, James has this constant thing. What do you do, right? From the very beginning, you remember, you find yourself in a time of trial. What do you do? Cry out to God. And what's his attitude? He loves to help. Okay. Fourth thing, God always works for our good and his glory. So we're doing this by faith. Sometimes God lets us see it right away. Something happens and we get to see the outworking of it. We get to see, right, even as uh, Lizzie was talking about here in her testimony, I, I, they almost, they set me up really well today right, in terms of that. You know, she's in that darkness of struggling, I think it was celiac disease is what you were talking about, Lizzie, right? You're struggling with that gastrointestinal thing, pain, difficulty, not easily fixed, the, the struggle of it, all those kind of things along those lines. At that moment, God, what are you doing? Well, the only thing that I do know that he's always doing is he's trying to get me to not trust myself and to lean in and trust him. He wants me to draw near to him and he will draw near to me. So I know he's always doing that and that's the ultimate. And when you think about the ultimate end of our existence, right, Paul says it, and we will be with Christ forever. I know he's doing that every day. So I know the pressure's there. Also, I know that he's always working through our own suffering to accomplish something through us as we lean into him when we suffer. So as people are brought in, right? When you suffer, if you're a wife or a husband or you're a part of a family, your whole family suffers. When somebody at Emmanuel suffers, we suffer if we love you. And God's bringing people around you into your suffering to do something in you and through you through that suffering. Now, I'm trusting God that he's always at work because he's a good God and he's got intentions. We may not see it in our lifetime. But I'm confident that God, this is one of the key things, that one day, one day by his mercy, he's going to take us back and show us how death was working backwards to reclaim everything. So his life penetrates it. So we'll come there. And then E, hold on, Christ is coming. Now, the issue here is that this is the vibrant hope of a Christian, and hold on gives you the implication that life is going to be full of adversity. We talked about how Jesus says at the end of his uh, uh, um, upper room discourse, as it's called in the book of John, he says, uh, in this world you will have trouble, but don't worry, take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus doesn't say, if you follow me, things are going to go great. You'll be popular. You'll never get sick. Everybody in your life will always do the right things. You know, your life will be perfect. No, that's not what he says. In this world, you will have trouble. And if you love people, even if your own life in a a kind of a, a large way is not trouble, you're going to be stepping into the trouble of other people. And you're going to bear it on your shoulders, you're going to carry it in your heart. It's going to come out of your eyes in tears, and you're going to yearn for them for relief, for blessing, for protection, right? All those kind of things. But hold on, Christ is coming. There'll be a day of vindication. There'll be a day of justice. There will be a day of the realization of everything that God has promised. So hold on. And in God's timetable, what we think is long to Him is short. And then finally, everything needed to have and hold on to genuine life is provided us through God's ears, through prayer, through God's word, and through God's people. James is going to, he repeatedly goes back to each one of those, is that if you're in trouble, you need to pray, right? If you need wisdom, well, I've given you words, so listen to do it. Be hearers who are doers receive the truth that you have and let it take shape and grow up into your soul and dominate it. And then you need God's people, and this is what we're going to see here. This is kind of the subtext of James all the way through. James uh, cannot see any place for a lone ranger for Jesus, Christian. There's no such person. You're entwined in in a community. You're responsible. Matter of fact, he's going to end the whole book with a charge for us to have a loving vigilance over each other's lives. And that assumes that you have others that you're concerned about and that you have others who are concerned about you. And they are looking at you, not just as somebody who comes in and talks about the, you know, NCAA final tournament or somebody who talks about the weather, or somebody who talks about your job, but somebody that they are thinking about in terms of their spiritual growth and health. So we're going to talk about that. Now, so let's come to our first, our chapter here, 
And before I get into the first one, let's read it together. So would you stand with me? And let's read our our final section. We're in chapter 5, verse 13. And we want to think about three different things, three different types of situations he's going to talk about. Uh, And he's going to basically say, if you're a person that believes that God is good and that he's always good, then you're going to put God at the center of all of your life, no matter what the experience is. So he's going to chart out at least three different types of experiences. If you're having a hard time, we'll talk about that one, then you should pray. If things are really going well, you should sing. And if you're going through a life-threatening situation, you need to call in righteous reinforcements. That's what we're going to talk about today. So let's read. Is there anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Well, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let me illustrate, verse 17. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. You may be seated. One of the things that uh, you're going to find this repeated focus on prayer that we're going to look at, but the very first one is to put this way, tough moments call for prayer. And I I hope you have your bulletin. There's some places for notes. If you have your notes that you've been studying the book of James, you've got a place to take notes for the sermon. And again, I'm not encouraging you to write down everything. You won't be able to do that, but you need to write down the thing that God wants you to remember as you get away. Maybe there's a couple things that you want, but you want to write those down. Don't don't be calm, and this is one of the things that, that I struggle with and can become a part of the Christian environment, especially where we are in the West, is we get used to hearing lots of spiritual things, but we don't do anything with any of it. And, and you would be better off if you had something that you just got a hold of and you wrestled with it all week. You started looking at your life and say, is this true of me? God, if I believed you, would this affect the way I'm facing this difficulty? If I really trusted that you were good, would I be doing the things that I'm doing right here? God, am I making space for you truly in my life? Have I called upon you in prayer? Or do I only call upon you in prayer when I'm in trouble as if I've got life the rest of the time? So those are the kinds of things that you ought to be thinking about. Don't become a person who just dabbles, right? You walk along the edge of the seashore, your feet get wet, but you never actually just get fully dunked. So you want to go in and let something get a hold of you. Okay? I'm, 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 I'm worried about that because if you get used to handling the scriptures and you're around it all the time, but you don't take any of it seriously, then pretty soon you begin to doubt its effectiveness to change you. And all of a sudden, uh, it's not worth my time. The problem's not with the scriptures, with God's word. The problem is the uptake with the engagement with it. So James is the one that taught us if you're going to really engage the word of God in a way to transform you, well, then you've got to listen to do. So I'm gonna encourage you to do that. So the first one he mentions right off the bat is a person who is in trouble. So in trouble, and this is, the term that he uses here is not a term that he uses anywhere else in the book of James. It's a term that Paul uses a lot in 2 Timothy, if you wanted to think about it there. But he uses it to Timothy, and he keeps telling Timothy to endure hardship, endure hardship. Timothy, endure hardship. And then he compares it to, in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And it seems to be, uh, be prepared for the kind of deprivations, the kind of, of losses and impact and persecution that's going to come for a someone who serves Christ and the gospel, who proclaims Jesus and calls people to believe in Jesus and represents Jesus. Just expect that in this world that's in opposition to Christ and his kingdom that you're going to experience hardship. 
And so if you look at Paul's life, if you want to look at some of his hardship, you can go back and read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 and the kind of things that Paul says that he went through that were marks of his faithfulness to the gospel were things like shipwrecks, uh, being robbed on the highways, uh, being stoned for his faith, right? All those kinds of things. So when he's talking about hardship, he's just talking about things that you're going through, it seems to be, for the sake of being faithful to Christ, now, in the p- people in the book of James, well, what kind of hardship are they going through? Well, they've lost their homes. They've lost their families. Okay? They've lost some of their husbands, wives, grandmas, and grandpas who have rejected them because they don't accept their Jesus. As Paul thought when he was persecuting Christians, they're not following Yahweh. They're not following God. They're blasphemers. They should be killed. So in the backdrop, the hardship that they're going through, and what does he say? Back like in chapter 1 and verse 5, if you find yourself in a time of testing, you find yourself in a time of difficulty, what should you do? You should pray, okay? Now, he doesn't talk about here, well, what do you mean? What, What should I pray about? So, okay, I pray, but what do I pray about? Well, if we read our way all the way through the book of James, there's a whole bunch of things that we would have picked up by now about how we should pray and how we shouldn't pray, okay? So I just give you a couple of them here is prayer is the ultimate statement that I'm coming to you with an attitude of humility. You're my only hope, dependence, right? I'm not coming to you because James gives the wrong kind of prayer. Is the kind of prayer, well, number one, that doesn't even pray because I don't think God can help me in this way. I got to figure it out my own, so I don't even pray. Or when I do come to him, I tell him what he should do to be a good God. So God, you just need to fix this right now, and if you're a good God, you'll do that. And we don't say that out loud because it sounds a little too arrogant to say that. We just assume it, and the only way we know that we had that kind of premise is when God doesn't come through in the right time or he doesn't come through in the way we thought he should have, that's when we get upset with him. And so James is dealing with people who have given up on God one, or number two, that they've belittled him to the point where they're trying to arrogantly tell him what he should do. And so it's a statement of dependence. You are our hope. It's a statement of trust. I'm coming to God saying every good thing comes down. You know, I don't, I don't care what kind of person you have in your life who's treating you unjustly or not giving you what they rightfully should give to you. What God wants to say to you is that person, whoever they are, cannot keep you from the resources that you need to know life today. Don't excuse your behavior because they're being bad. Don't, don't belittle God and say, well, if that my wife or my husband or, or my neighbor or my boss, if they would just treat me right, then my life would be better. Now, in some ways, certainly it may be better, but what Jesus wants to say is that you can be fully faithful, full of life, even if they never treat you right. Because every gift comes down. They don't stop my goodness from getting to you because it all comes down from me to you. So it encourages us, but also holds us accountable. Somebody's bad behavior is not an excuse for me to behave badly. Somebody's bad behavior is not an excuse for me to abandon God and figure out how to figure it on my own. So everything comes down from you, and then I'm going to turn from myself. Not my will, but yours be done. So as I'm working through, right, I have walked as a pastor. You have walked with friends that have died young. You've walked with people who, as we would say it, have lived a full life. And so it's a little easier when they're in their 90s. But still, there's always pain in separation. We're not made for the separation. There's still pain for me in the absence of the ones that I've lost. I miss them. I get drawn back into the sweetness of what my dad passed on to me, and I miss him. Because God didn't make me just for this life. And so, in these moments, I have to keep saying, Lord, this is what I would long for. God, I'd like you to do this. And I think, as Jesus taught us to pray... Lord, given your will, given your purposes, Lord, I'm praying, Lord, would you heal this person? Lord, would you, would you restore this group of people? Lord, would you? And I know that that's what God wants. He wants to relieve suffering. I don't know if he wants to actually do it in that way. God's going to relieve every believer's suffering in the most significant way because he's going to relieve them from eternal suffering. He's already done the big work. 
The question is, how are they going to get to the ultimate goal? And maybe they'll live a long life. Maybe they won't. Maybe I'll get to walk with them the whole, maybe I won't. But the issue is here is I, I'm saying, not my will, Lord, but your be done. Not my will. But if it's possible, Lord, as Jesus prayed, would you? If it's possible, Lord, would you? And so the prayer life, so tough moments call for prayer. And James has taught us how to pray and how not to pray in terms of that. So that's the first one, right? The second thing, good moments call for praise, right? There's an old saw in the business world. I don't know if it still holds true. I think it's kind of right. Is uh, if, if uh, I think we heard this from um, the, the woman at the time was the CEO over uh, Kings Island at one time. And she came to give a, uh, uh, it's not Kings Island anymore, is it now? What's it, is it still called Kings Island? Uh, it tells me, I have to ask Sarah, she's a regular at Kings Island, I'm not. But uh, if, if you go down there, she talked about, you know, if you do something bad, if you, if you offend somebody or they get poor service or whatever, the, the odds are they will tell 11 other people about it. And that was the pre-social media era. Now it's probably 1,100 people about it. 11,000 people, depending on their influence in terms of that. And then go out on, you know, uh, Yelp and give a review and Yahoo and everything else, right? All those kind of things that are happening. But what you find if somebody feels that they haven't been treated right or they didn't get their full money's worth or whatever, they're going to at least 11 people, they're going to multiply it 11 times over. If, you, if a person has a great day, it was something like they'll tell maybe five people. And, of course, one of the indicators about us uh, often with God is that when we're in trouble and we want something that's not happening, we're talking to God all the time, when things, God has blessed us and we're celebrating the goodness of what God has given us in Christ uh, two or three times. And so we, we don't orient in that way. And so on the one level, there are times where you have circumstances in life where things are going well, right? And this, this gets to be difficult at times in the Christian life as Paul says, at the Christian life, often, day in and day out, you're rejoicing with those who rejoice and you're weeping with those who weep. I mean, every day, every day you've got these, if you're involved in a, in a group of people, you've, almost, you've got some people over here that you're, you're clapping and cheering over here because there's sweet things that are going on, and you've got people over here that you're weeping and crying over. But you should be rejoicing with the people who rejoice and not just weeping all the time over the people who are rejoicing. And so we as Christians should be people who rejoice with God's goodness because we delight in giving thanks to God for his mercy. His mercy is more. Now, in a fundamental way, when we come to church, even if we've had a difficult week as we were talking about before, we can give praise to God because ultimately he's delivered me from everything that truly threatens me. So I come in this moment of my own struggle with a security that God has brought me to himself. He saved me. Everything he's promised to me is going to come to fruition. And today he's given me every resource I need to walk through this day and not bail and not lose it. So I have that. I have a confidence in it. And I can give him thanks for that. I'm not giving him thanks for the difficulty itself. I'm not giving him thanks for the injustice I'm receiving from someone else. I'm asking him for wisdom on how to do that. But it's undergirded by this confidence that that person, this event, that thing cannot take from me the things that really matter. And so I have an unearthly calm in the face of a crazy moment got an unearthly calm. And it's not that I'm not engaged. It's not that I'm not crying. It's not that I'm not uh, advocating with passion, but it's undergirded by security and not with the idea that I've got to get this fixed here for my life to go on. Now, I want to bring you into the goodness of God, but I'm secure in him. And so the issue here is that we should be people that regularly praise. One of the things that, that Ron and I have tried to do, because we catch ourselves, right? I don't know, in your own prayer life, when you go to pray, whatever is the most pressing thing just blurts out of your mouth right away. God, I need help on, you know, X, Y, Z. We, we, we've forced each other to, before we start talking about the people that we want to pray for and the situation we want to pray for, we just want to pause and reflect on God a little bit. Because we need to be reminded of who he is to reorient us toward the problems. And we need to bring his greatness and his love to bear on this situation, both for us and for the people we're praying for. 
And we need to bring his potential into this so that we don't think it's hopeless. Why? With God, right? This is Jesus, God's own word. With God, all things are possible. Right? Well, I'm coming to that kind of God to ask for this group of people or for myself the kind of things that are here. So I need to reflect a little bit before I just start running in. And I need to be reminded of who I'm talking to. And I also need to be reminded of a God that the measure of his love is the cross of Jesus. So as I'm, I'm suffering, how much does God love me? Well, let me just go sit at the cross for a little bit, Jesus. God, how powerful are you? Well, Greg, just look around at this creation and then go with me and stand at the empty tomb. That's me. Okay, let's talk. So the issue here about praise is something fundamental that we need to do on an ongoing way, but especially we as a group of people and you as individuals, when God does something, when he answers a prayer, when you see your child loving the things of Jesus, when you see them making a wise choice, when you see your spouse loving Jesus and serving him and loving your kids, when you see a brother or sister loving on another brother or sister, when you see someone serving with joy, when you see somebody using their gifts, there's something to thank God for every time. And we ought to be the first people who walk up and say thank you. And God, thank you for blessing me through them. People of thanks, right? So if you've got things that are going well, you should be giving praise. And if you're, if, if you're a person who's struggling, right, you'll know that you're struggling well when you don't crap on other people who are praising while you're struggling. One of the biggest struggles, right, when you're going through darkness is you don't want to hear about anybody else's success. When you're living a life of 27 dresses and you're going to everybody else's wedding, it's hard for you to rejoice with the girl who just got engaged. Right? When you're going through a time of suffering and health issues and you're talking to someone who's never had a health issue in their life, you just want to say, shut up. You don't know. Right? I mean, don't you want to do that? Just shut up. I don't want to hear that. Well, no, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. That ultimately is revealing that I'm upset with God and saying, God, it's not fair. You've given me the short end of the stick and I'm mad at you and I'm going to take it out on my brother or sister. And so I don't care if they're having a good day. They shouldn't have a good day because I'm not having a good day and I'm mad at you. And so God's saying, no, no, if you're turning your heart toward me, you're going to be reminded of my goodness. You're going to be reminded of my purposes. You're going to trust me for the long haul. You're going to trust me that I'm always doing something good. Your own path is unique to you. God's going to use you in a unique way. You're going to have your own unique story. It's going to situate you to talk into other people's lives that nobody else can but you. And so you're believing in him for that, and ultimately all things will be well. And I'm holding on to that. So day after day after day. So we should be people who can praise and we should be able to be able to enjoy God's goodness to each other right now there's a good way to handle we, we there's long things to talk here about how you steward your suffering as well as how you steward your blessings okay one of the things that I do know is the blessings that you have are not because you're the most favored child in the kingdom number one Number two, the sufferings that you have is not because you're the unfavorite child in the kingdom. Because that's just not how God operates. God loves us all equally. He has his own purposes in our lives. We trust him. That's why we pray, Lord, not my will, but your will. Right? So two. Then the third one is life-threatening moments. So here's where he comes uh, down at the end uh, as he moves forward. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick... Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And then he gives an illustration of Elijah. Now, here's what I want to talk about here about who the sick are. Now, almost all translations translate it as sick. And when you look at the word itself that's being translated here, the basic idea of the word is powerlessness, weakness. It's often just translated as weak. If you've ever read 2 Corinthians, Paul always talks about how God's strength is perfected in his weakness. And so the idea of weakness here 
uh, is the underlying cause. And I want to suggest to you here because I don't think James is just speaking about physical illnesses. I think he's speaking much more broadly about events that disempower a person where you, you, are, you are broken down, where you're made unstable emotionally, psychologically. Right? And of course, we have in the present moment, right? We, in, the, in this present moment, it plays out at Cedarville University where I am, but it's in true in the, in the culture at large. We have an epidemic of depression. None of those people often are not physically ill, right? Obviously so. There may be physical uh, accompaniments to that, but depression is a, anxiety is a epidemic, we have an epidemic of, of apathy and hopelessness that has led to unprecedented levels of suicide. And so James is speaking into those moments, the, the moments where you, if you put, where you feel overwhelmed, where you feel like you, don't, you need reinforcements. You, you need, I need help, right? And, and, and if you're a, you're a follower of, of Jesus, well, who do you call? You call the people in the darkest moment of your life who you think can take you to the one resource who can help you navigate it. You want good advice from people who walk with Jesus, who know his heart. You want them to come in, help me. Help me to think right about myself. Help me to think right about this moment. Help me to think right about the people that are affecting me this way. Lord, get, help me. Help that's a vulnerability in this moment. But this is something that's overwhelming you. This is something where you need reinforcements for people to come in. So it's someone who's lacking in strength to the point that they feel overwhelmed. Right? You know, what the evil one will try to get you to do when you feel overwhelmed is just to hide, to disappear from people. The people that I, that I love that are going through tr troubles, I've often say to it, and I'll say this to you, I said, don't hide. Don't run from me. And if you disappear, I'm going I'm to see that as a yellow flag almost turning pink. I'm going to see that because the evil one wants to move you away from the people who are going to keep hold of you and keep you close to Jesus. So the picture, you know, if you get the picture of, of the four men, the friends who are bringing the man to Jesus, do you remember that? Where they so desperately want to get their buddy to Jesus, and it was so crowded they couldn't get in, so they were not going to be deterred. So what do they do? They rip up the poor guy's roof. I don't know how the guy that was the house felt all about you know their desperation, but he rips up the rips up the roof and lays the guy down right through the roof to Jesus, so that they could get him there. And Jesus looks up and he sees their faith. And sometimes your faith is going to be sustained by other people's faith. Sometimes you need people to believe for you when you feel like you can't hold on anymore. And they're keeping you from going to the darkness. People will run to drugs and alcohol. People will run to kind of illicit sexual activities to find some numbness. They'll run to cutting and anorexia and bulimia. They'll run to all kinds of things to bring feeling back, the sense of purpose, direction, and they'll run to suicide. And when you feel overwhelmed, call in reinforcements. Call in reinforcements. So if you have physical illness is one of those moments, discouragement, spiritual weakness, right? Some of us, we've known it, right? COVID over this past year separated us from each other. And for many of you who, who, who depended on this community, just to keep reminding you of your identity, keep reminding you of where you're heading, keep reminding you of God and his goodness. When you get isolated, those old habits that you thought you had kicked, they come right back. Because that's the way you used to cope with your depression. That's the way you used to cope with this frustration of life. We need each other. Sometimes I just need to be reminded in the eyes of another person that I matter to somebody. You never, right? This body should be such a place that nobody ever underestimates the significance of their very presence. Your presence should leave just a gaping whole if it's absence we should be the kind of people that i'm looking for you you're looking for me even if I, not everybody touches me all the time right i we probably couldn't do that we'd be here all morning right but the idea here is that you ought to come in and people ought to be greeting one another and it's not just the howdy duties it's the people that are saying i'm so glad you're here i love you uh, you're welcome here you're important to me and i want to spend some of my life on you and you'd be reminded that that's a vision of a God who's always near, who's always available, and it's just being pictured to you by your brother or sister. 
So when you come in, it may be a physical illness, it may be discouragement, it may be a spiritual weakness, it may be an emotional weariness, right? Well, you, you've been struggling in a relational problem for a long time, and you're trusting in and you're leaning on God, and you just feel sapped. God, is it any use? Maybe I should just bail. Get weary. Get weary. And, and you just, oh, I don't know if I have the energy anymore. I don't know if I have energy to care anymore. I just want to not care. That's why you need to come. No, no, no. God cares. God sustains. I care. Let's hold on. So all these kinds. And sometimes it's fear. Right? We had, one of the things that happened over this COVID thing is we had people that struggled, right, as we were given the DEFCON 5 warnings, right, repeatedly day in and day out, day in and day out. We had people that were afraid to go outside, people afraid to interact with people, people afraid to just live life in terms of that. And we need to help people not to live in a state of fear. All right. Now here I want to, so I want to remind you, this is a picture. Um, this is Edward Munchen, right? If you know Munchen, he's mostly famous for his picture, The Scream. If you remember that Scream picture, this is the same guy. He's a pretty depressing guy, Edvard is his name. He's a pretty depressing guy, late 1800s. He was obsessed with mortality, death, and suffering. So whenever you went to his gallery, you were immediately cheered, right, as you walked in. Um, so as you, you came in, muted colors, expression sort of style as you get there. This is one of his earliest paintings, and he wrote, he painted this uh, to... Um, commemorate uh, his sister who had died as a teenager. And that's, that's the mom sitting right next to her. And, and the picture is, is uh, I think it's, uh, her middle name is Sophie, that's all I can remember because it stuck out to me, of the Joanna Sophie, I think her name is. But she died. Her, his mom struggled with TB most of her life. But you can see there that she's uh, propped up on a pillow, pretty strengthless, pretty weak, and looking over at her mother, and her mother can't look at her in the eyes because she's just overwhelmed with the grief of this moment. And I think James is talking about both Sophie and her mom. I think he's talking about both of them. Some of you have faced the Sophie moments where you've got a physical illness, but many of you are walking alongside of other people who have deep physical illnesses, but they also have deep spiritual illnesses, and you're suffering and yearning for them. So that's what James is talking about here. All right. Now, so who's he calling, right? If you come here, who's he calling? Quickly, he's calling for the elders, and so here the church leadership. And what's he going to call them to do? And so here I want to th talk about some things that seem maybe a little mysterious, but, but really aren't if you study the idea of anointing all the way through. There's no medicinal quality to oil that's being used here. So it's not sort of like a medicine they're applying, like a holy medicine. But usually the, the idea of oil is often associated with joy. And it's, it's associated with recognizing the specialness of someone. And in this case, the specialness of that person to God and conveying God's affection and care for them to them in a symbolic way. And so when the elders come in, they're going to pray. And you want them to pray. And why call on the elders? Because hopefully they'll be righteous people. In the book of James, what it means is they will not only be right with God, but they will think rightly, and they will be praying in the way that they should be praying in a dark moment like this. You need someone, when you're in a moment where you're overwhelmed, you don't know what to pray. You don't know if you can pray. You need someone to come and help you pray for what you ought, and somebody to pray when you can't. And you want somebody who's walking with the Lord, with wisdom from the Lord, to bring to bear on this dark moment, in this moment. And so also at the same time, there's always the possibility that this difficulty, this suffering is rooted in sin, right? Emotional, psychological suffering is often rooted in sin. And there's a need to recognize something that you haven't dealt with and to confess it and clear accounts with God. This becomes especially important if it's a physical illness. This is the last stage of your life on earth. 
We had an event that somebody just reminded me of this morning. We had a, a couple here years ago that a person got diagnosed with cancer. And that person was known for just being difficult, kind of not kind, kind of domineering. And this person got that, that, that uh, diagnosis, and she had a terminal uh, diagnosis, and it did turn out to be terminal within a matter of months. But in that moment, she turned her heart away from that and become the sweetest, most affirming, she went around from individual to individual confessing her sins and clearing accounts before God. And she left her family with a sweet aroma of healing. And that's one of those moments where God, one of the God's mercies, right? Every time I go to a funeral, is a deep sadness. But you know, a funeral is a, is a mercy. It's reminding us, death is the reminder that apart from God's help, we can't make it. It's an enemy that we can't defeat. It should bring us to the end of ourselves and make us look outward. So if need be, confession. And then finally, as we end here at the end of uh, James, he says that every moment calls for loving vigilance. So I ask the, the team to come up here uh, as we sing. But notice here, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. All right, today is a day for you to watch over me and me to watch over you. Today is a day when the evil one wants me to follow my own evil desires and abandon Jesus and walk away and find some other way to navigate life and I need you to help me not lose my mind. And one of the measures of our love is our willingness to speak into each other's lives. Right? You know what this assumes as well? Is that we know one another, that we've engaged with one another in such a way that we have the platform to do these kinds of things. You can't make the church a lecture hall and do this. You can't attend online and do that. Right? You can't be on the fringes of the community and do that. And I'm telling you, if you're on the fringes of the community and that's kind of the adopted way that you've come to engage the EBC, I'm telling you, you're in a dangerous place. You need us. We need you. We need you. We need you. And we need each other. We can't walk it by ourselves. So this is the way we want to plow into each other. If you need ways where you can find to get connected with people, we'll help you. Right? You don't want to walk alone. Okay, are we broken? Yes. Will we bruise and, and, and bang up on each other? Yes, because we're all broken. But I'm trusting Jesus that we need to lean into each other and love each other because it's too dangerous. We're too weak. We need God's ears. We need his word. And we need each other. Will you sing for us? All right.